Hi everyone, and welcome to this third and last part of this training course dedicated to diesel hydro treatments. As we saw before, the process of hydro treatment needs hydrogen, pressure, temperature, and catalyst. But how do all these parameters interact together and what are the operating variables once the unit is in operation? The first operating parameter is the hydrogen partial pressure. This parameter is directly set by the pressure within the unit and by the molar fraction of hydrogen in the gaseous phase. The location where we consider this hydrogen partial pressure is at the outlet of the reactor. Why? Because it's at this place that the most refractory molecules are going to be desulfurized. The desulfurization increases if the partial pressure in hydrogen increases, and reversely. The second main operating parameter is the recycle hydrogen rate. This recycle is defined by the total quantity of hydrogen recycled towards the feed in nm cubes per hour of pure hydrogen divided by the total feed volumetric flow at ambient temperature. The state-of-the-art rule which we applied, and which is also favored by the catalyst suppliers, is to hide between 2.5 and 4 times the total hydrogen consumption at reactor inlet. This is to avoid the phenomenon of hydrogen starvation. This means to avoid running locally out of hydrogen. It is also to be pointed out that this hydrogen recycle is necessary to avoid the phenomenon of cracking and excessive polymerization as well as to ensure a good distribution of hydrogen in the feed. This hydrogen recycle also favors the desulfurization, just like the hydrogen partial pressure does. These two parameters are not totally independent, because as soon as we recyclate more and more hydrogen, the hydrogen purity in the recycled gas is going to increase, and the facto to contribute to the increase in hydrogen partial pressure. The third important parameter is the residence time of the feed in the reactor. This residence time is defined by the ratio of catalytic volume divided by the feed volumetric flow rate at ambient temperature. Once in operation, the quantity of catalyst is set by the reactor volume, but the feed throughput still remains an operating parameter. The higher the residence time, the longest the time when diesel material stays in contact with the catalyst, the better will be the desulfurization, and reversely. For your information, the magic value of this residence time is about one hour. Meaning that, for a new unit, we are used to sizing reactors so that the feed remains in contact with the catalyst for about one hour. We shall thus note that the HTS reactions are rather slow. And it is exactly because these reactions are slow that we can stage the reactions and put several beds separated by a quench zone. If the reaction were fast, it would be impossible. The last important operating parameter is the temperature. We previously saw together that the desulfurization reactions were kinetic limited, in other words, limited by the temperature. Furthermore, we also said that all the reactions which occur in the reactor were exothermic, which means that the temperature at the exit of a catalytic bed is higher than the one at the inlet. You now may ask yourself, but what temperature is the most representative of the one in the reactor? To answer this question, we do a calculation by taking a third of the temperature of the reactor inlet to which we add two thirds of the temperature at the outlet. It is indeed this value which is considered to be the most representative of the catalytic bed. This is due to the fact that the temperature in a catalytic bed increases very quickly to the temperature at the outlet. We thus give a stronger weight to the temperature at the outlet of the bed in the calculation of the average temperature. Let's summarize all what we have said together. The sulfur in the product out of an HTS unit is dictated by the properties of the feed, the operating conditions, and the catalyst. The operating parameters are the hydrogen partial pressure, the recycled gas rate, the residence time, and the temperature. But then, in operation, how to control the reaction? 
The hydrogen partial pressure is set by the total pressure within the unit and the hydrogen purity in the recycle gas. The recycle gas rate is set by the capacity of the recycle gas compressor. The residence time is set by the quantity of catalyst provided that we do not change the feed throughput. So, the reaction is thus controlled by the temperature of the reactor, by adjusting the temperature at the heater outlet. Finally, during the cycle, we have the formation of coke at the surface of the catalyst. Remember that as soon as we exceed 370 degrees, we have a balance between hydrogenation and dehydrogenation of aromatics. This leads to the formation of coke. This coke is going to deposit on the surface of the catalyst. The catalyst is going to lose of its activity. It deactivates. This deactivation is linked to the feed properties and operating conditions. But then, how to manage this loss in catalytic activity? Well, by increasing the temperature. Moreover, we use this increase in temperature to monitor this catalytic deactivation. Units of measure are degrees per month. You can see on this graph the deactivation of a catalytic bed in time. After a while, due to the fact that the temperature has to be increased to cope with the catalytic deactivation, this temperature becomes too high. The catalyst cannot manage anymore to work under such high temperature. It deactivates more and more and more and more. It is then necessary to stop the unit and replace the catalyst. The time elapsed between the starting up of the unit and the replacement of the catalyst is called the cycle length. Let's come back to the process scheme and let's focus on the next steps when the feed exits the reaction section. This hydrotreated product still cannot be routed to the diesel pool. Why? Because this product contains dissolved hydrocarbons as well as H2S. This product would not thus be compatible with the objectives of flashpoint and H2S toxicity. We thus use a stripping section to remove these molecules. To remove the light dissolved molecules, as well as the H2S, we heat up back again the hydrotreated product in order to vaporize the molecules we want to get rid of. Then the product enters a column which we call stripper. This stripper is generally equipped with injection of live steam at tower bottoms, but we can also consider a, a reboiler under certain circumstances. The objective of live steam injection is to reduce the partial pressure of light hydrocarbons and to make the vaporization easier. At the stripper top, we extract the dissolved gases from the hydrotreated product, which we call off gases. These off gases will be typically routed to A main absorber to remove the H2S and then, in fine, to fuel gas network. The well depth which has been produced in the reactor is withdrawn from the stripper reflux drum. This well depth still contains some dissolved H2S because it is in equilibrium with off gas, which also contains H2S. This well depth will be reprocessed in the atmospheric distillation. And then, can we route the stripper bottoms to the diesel pool? The answer is still no because of the water content in the product. Due to the fact that live steam has been injected in a stripper, the bottom's product contains a too high water content which is incompatible with specifications. The ultimate stage is to dry this product with a dryer. The typical type of dryer which is considered is a vacuum dryer. The vacuum is created by steam ejectors. We decrease the pressure down to 100 millibars. And at this pressure, we succeed in vaporizing water. That's it. You now see that the HTS process consists in a reaction zone, a stripping section, and a dryer. To conclude, these units are essential to good operation of the refinery. These units are high-risk units 
because of the presence of pressure, temperature, but also H2S. These are very technical units because we use reactors for chemical reaction, fractionation for stripping, and several rotating machines for creating the pressure. It is also to be pointed out that we still continue building hydrotreating units and even in mature regions such as Europe. These units are also associated to the bottom of the barrel conversion, because the conversion units produce generally effluents that are necessary to be further hydrotreated. And finally, hydrotreatment is also necessary in other sectors like heavy oil upgrading, shale oil purification, and also vegetable oil transformation into biofuels. This is the end. Thank you for watching these videos. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye.